Hi everyone, I'm Ryan Funk and this is my gift to you, the social downfall of Bon Appetit. This ethics report stands as an in-depth examination and analysis of the social downfall of Bon Appetit magazine, the repercussions of the situation, and how the publication ultimately decided to respond and attempt to resolve the issues both internally with their employees and externally with the public. Currently owned by global mass media company Condé Nast and in publication since 1976, Bon Appetit, otherwise known as BA, is where food and culture meet by covering food through the lens of cooking, fashion, travel, technology, design, and home. In 2011, Adam Rappaport, former style editor at GQ Magazine, was appointed as BA's new editor-in-chief. To expand their reach and utilize the rapid popularity of digital media, BA launched their YouTube channel in 2012, but it wouldn't be until 2017 when the series Gourmet Makes with freelance pastry chef Claire Saffitz premiered on the channel and helped the channel rapidly gain a cult following. Between 2018 and 2019, BA saw a nearly 40% revenue increase solely from their video content, and subscriptions between all digital channels saw a 64% increase. The popularity of the YouTube channel benefited the publication immensely as increased viewership of the channel also increased readership of the magazine. BA was taking their staff and turning them into digital influencers and micro celebrities. The core group of current and former BA staffers involved in the crisis referenced in this report are the following. Andy Baragani, Molly Boz, Sola El Whaley, Priya Krishna, Brad Leone, Rick Martinez, Gabby Melian, Chris Morocco, Carla Lolly Music, and Claire Sabbats. The social downfall of the publication began on June 8, 2020, with former editor-in-chief Rappaport resigning after receiving mass criticism following a racist photo of him that had resurfaced online. The resignation then sparked an outpouring of stories and criticism from current and former employees of the magazine, critiquing not only Rappaport, but also accusing the magazine of pay discrimination against employees of color. The situation with Bon Appetit is interesting because how the publication dealt with it internally ultimately affected how external stakeholders reacted and responded to it. I wanted to start at the ground level and look at the Condé Nast employee code of conduct that all employees under the parent company are expected to follow. When looking over the code, there are a few things that stood out as red flags. The first is the simple fact that there is no indication when slash if this code has ever been updated or revised at any point before or after the crisis at BA last year. The next red flag is that it is a general overarching code of conduct for all employees that work at Condé Nast. There are currently 19 print and digital publications owned by the company, all of which do not have their own code that is relevant to their specific sector of the industry. The final red flag brings us into part of our crisis timeline. Under the Our Responsibilities section of the code, it is stated, quote, At Condé Nast, everyone should feel comfortable to speak their mind. We strive to create an open and supportive environment in which employees feel comfortable raising concerns with respect to conduct, end quote. On June 25th, 2020, two weeks after Rappaport resigned as editor-in-chief, BA video editor Matt Hunziker was suspended and placed under internal investigation simply for tweeting, quote, why would we hire someone who's not racist when we could simply, checks industry handbook, uh, hire a racist and provide them with anti-racism training, end quote. According to many BA employees, including former Test Kitchen talent Priya Krishna and Sola El Whaley, Hunziker was a consistent advocate in the newsroom for people of color. Krishna even going as far to tweet, quote, BA video editor Matt Hunziker was suspended by Condé for calling out systemic racism, while the company says it supports people speaking openly. Got it, end quote. It is apparent that the higher-ups at BA and Condé were uninterested in any means of inbound communication and dialogue on the issue, especially from those inside the machine. For many BA employees and former fans of the publication, the suspension of Hunziker for critiquing his workplace discredited the three press releases that the publication had already put out at the time, stating that they were working towards being, quote, transparent, accountable, and active in, being, in beginning to dismantle racism at our brands, end quote. After months of negotiations and back and forth, on August 6, Krishna El Whaley and Rick Martinez all announced they were exiting their contracts with Condé Nast Entertainment, CNE, quote, citing unsuccessful efforts at negotiating with Condé for equitable compensation. 
Shortly after that news broke, Gabby Mellian, former Test Kitchen manager, and Molly Boz, a senior food editor, joined their colleagues in exiting their contracts, stating that Condé Nast is not delivering on its promise to support diversity in its entertainment division. To add fuel to the fire, Jesse Sparks, an editorial assistant, and Ryan Walker Hartshorn, the executive assistant to former editor-in-chief Rappaport, the only two black editorial staffers at the publication, announced on August 7th that they were quitting, citing exploitation and a hostile work environment. In response to the mass exodus, Condé Nast head of HR Stan Duncan wrote in a staff memo, quote, we are sorry to see some of our video contributors part ways, but we feel we cannot break the standard compensation rates we've set across our teams now in order to keep them, as some have been requesting, end quote. Scholars state that one of the things that responsible PR professionals do is, quote, maintain respect for stakeholders and treat them with dignity, end quote. By not wanting to break the standard, Condé Nast showed an immense level of disrespect towards their staffers and devalued them as people because they viewed them as not worth fighting to keep. After facing some of her own backlash following stories of previous discriminatory actions in the test kitchen, Carla Lolly Music, editor-at-large and former host of the popular back-to-back -back chef series, announced on August 12th that she was also exiting her contract stating that Condé was unable or unwilling to articulate specific measurable goals about diversity and inclusion among BA hosts, crew, show topics, or recipe selection. If you're keeping up at home, that is six members of the core group of on-camera talent that exited CNE within a matter of a week. And to round out the crew, we jump ahead to October 6th, the day that Claire Saffitz, the woman behind the immensely successful Gourmet Mix series, and arguably the most popular member of that test kitchen group announced that she had terminated her contract not only with CNE but with also but also with VA at the end of May 2020. After a nearly four month hiatus, the Bon Appetit YouTube channel was active once again, revealing a new slate of chefs teaming up alongside previous hosts Brad Leone, Chris Morocco, and Andy Baragani, who chose to stay with the publication. What I found interesting and odd about this comeback for Bon Appetit was that the announcement video is unlisted, meaning that only those who have the link to the video can view it, and it does not show up on the Bon Appetit channel video feed. The unlisted video may have stopped the announcement from circulating YouTube, but it did not stop the public from giving their input, as the video currently has over 1.7 thousand dislikes and hundreds of comments to the likes of, quote, it's truly wild how much you guys blew this, end quote, and quote, they didn't even try to apologize. Just wait long enough and hope the audience forgets, end quote. Bon Appetit can run from their problems, but they can't hide from their stakeholders. If I were in the shoes of the PR practitioners at Condé and Bon Appetit, I would go about the situation using a two-way symmetrical model of communication, as well as following the model of responsible and effective advocacy as explained by scholar Linda Hahn. I would use the two-way model of communication to sit down with all the staff involved and first, and the first thing I would do would be to open up the floor and hear from them first. Symmetrical communication for me is all about listening first and talking second. With this crisis being the culmination of years of internal issues, the work must be done from the inside out. If there is a cog in the machine, the machine cannot properly work until it is fixed for long-term success. By first listening to the concerns of the staff, I as a practitioner can then use those concerns to then begin to strategize how to best resolve the issues and maintain relationships between all involved. My other recommendation would be to follow the four-step model of responsible and effective advocacy with activist publics as also presented by Linda Hahn. This model starts out with environmental scanning. BA needs to not only focus on resolving issues internally among the staff, but also develop a plan to maintain their relationship with their audience, who ultimately have a large influence on the reader and viewership of BA's content. Next would be identifying public, which publics, which I believe that in this situation, both the BA staffers and the external stakeholders, mainly the audience and outside media personnel, could be considered activist publics as they were collectively highly aware of the issues and updates, as well as continuing the conversations and actively communicating. As far as effective relationships management, we've got that somewhere covered already by approaching the situation in a more symmetrical way as opposed to asymmetrical. And finally, with symmetrical conflict resolution, 
in combination with the integrative symmetrical strategy, cooperation between BA and its internal staff would be the best way to go about things. Mentioned multiple times by multiple different BA staffers, one of their biggest issues was the lack of compensation for their work and all they wanted was to be paid on par with their white counterparts. By cooperating and working in tandem with their employees, BA could have saved themselves a lot of reputation damage in the long term. Because this situation was so recent and so massive, there's not a lot of academic or peer-reviewed literature specifically about it yet due to issues like this having been commonly swept under the rug in the media and publishing industries. This was arguably one of the most covered stories within the media industry last year, as was the first big attempt towards dismantling an inherently racist and patriarchal system from the inside. This is a literal new chapter for these industries, as BA might have been one of the first, but they will not be the last.